Hi everyone and welcome to another mini lecture. Here we will take up the topic of diversity and education and consider how diversity works in our public school system. So what do we mean by diversity and education? Are we speaking of diversity in terms of categories such as race, gender, and SES? Well, kind of, but using these categories seems a bit static. Maybe we need to think about how diversity works. So first, let's look at an example of diversity using categories. You might remember this graph from the Achievement Gap Lecture. It depicts the racial and ethnic distribution of public school students from 2003 through 2013. It shows years on the x-axis and percent by enrollment on the y-axis. It also shows differences by geographic region. Beginning from the bottom, or darkest shade of green, we see the percent of students categorized as white. Moving up to the next shade, we see the percent of students categorized as black, and so on up to 100%. What we can clearly see is the makeup of student population by race. So how does this help us understand diversity? Well, we can see that the largest single group of students is categorized as white, although the size of this group is getting smaller. We might know that historically, public education was established to meet the needs of this dominant group. And slowly, with varying degrees of success, schools began to serve different race and gender populations. Nevertheless, the origins of U.S. public schooling were created around the needs and interests of the white group. Many education scholars argue that this thinking still prevails today, despite the idea that education is the great equalizer for all groups in our society. What do you think? In the Achievement Gap mini lecture, we looked at different ways schooling works to segregate and further emphasize our differences in terms of categorizing students and using data like test scores to create gaps. We saw examples of how education outcomes vary by categories such as race, gender, and SES. And educational approaches to the gap are often focused on the so-called deficient groups, which are not the dominant group. We said in the Achievement Gap Lecture that categories work to both magnify our differences and help us see inequities in the system. Here is another chart with educational attainment by race that helps highlight an inequity. Let's take a moment to read this graph. The x-axis is race and the y-axis is percent. The colors represent different levels of educational attainment. The darkest color is a bachelor's degree or graduate degree. With each lighter shade of color, we see less educational attainment. So how does this chart help us see inequity? We can see that many more people categorized as Hispanic have less than a high school education than all other categories. Let's think about categories, diversity, and education a bit more. The Education Week Research Center developed the Chance for Success Index to better understand the role that education plays in promoting positive outcomes across an individual's lifetime. Based on an original state-by-state -state analysis, this index combines information from 13 indicators that span a person's life from cradle to career. You can see those indicators on the left, on the y-axis. Note how many of those indicators involve education. At the top of the indicators, you can see Virginia's grade is 86.1% or a B. We rank fifth in the nation and the national average is a C plus. We can see in the graph 
that educational attainment is a big factor of our overall chances for success. Could we agree then that education is valued by our society, that education is important to being successful in our culture? Let's connect culture and education. Here is a painting by American artist Thomas Granger. Let's read this painting to understand school and culture a little bit more. The painting depicts a schoolhouse in the U.S. colonial period. This was likely New England because we know the artist was from Maine. We see boys and girls, which was special to the more progressive ideas about education in the New England colonies. We can surmise the curriculum was probably basic reading and arithmetic. So what could we say about education, diversity, and culture from this painting? Let's ask who the students are. Who is being educated and who is not? Where are the students of color? Who is the teacher? This was before the teaching profession became feminized. We might say by reading this picture that the culture of colonial New England valued education for boys and girls, but only white children and not children of color. That the values and beliefs of the culture were expressed in its education system. So broadly put, culture is a system of values, beliefs, and ways of knowing that guides the decisions and thinking and behavior of groups of people. Culture intersects with social categories such as race, SES gender, and many others. In terms of education, culture is reflected in who attends schooling and who does not, in the curriculum, and who the teachers are, in the way school is funded. So who decides these things? Well, we know we are a pluralistic democratic society comprised of many groups with differing values and beliefs. However, one culture is dominant. The dominant culture shapes the larger society, including and especially its education system. Education, then, prepares students to function successfully in that dominant culture and to promote its values and beliefs. So what happens when people from different cultural groups encounter every, uh, each other? This happens all the time, right? But how well do they communicate even when both are speaking the same language? Think about teachers and students from different categories or cultures. Do you think they harbor unconscious biases or stereotypes about each other? They probably do. And this doesn't mean they are bad people only that individuals form these biases often outside of their conscious awareness because that's how culture works. Everyone holds unconscious beliefs about various social and identity groups, and these biases stem from our tendency to organize the world by categories. If culture intersects with categories, then cultural identity might be thought of as a sense of belonging to that category or group. In our society today, we have many cultural groups. Maybe we should ask how well students from different cultures identify with the dominant culture in school. More importantly, how are students' needs being met by a cultural system that may reflect different values and beliefs? This issue is often reflected in discipline policies, which is a deep and important topic we don't have time to go into here. In our increasingly connected world, could we make a case for moving beyond categories only when we talk about diversity and consider how diversity works instead? Could we think of diversity as being open to and including different values and beliefs? 
let me conclude by coming back to our original question. What do we mean by diversity in the context of education? Is it about categories? Well, yes and no. Cultural identity usually means different categories of race or gender or SES or religion or something. What about perspective? Does perspective matter? Is diversity something that we experience? Just this week, Dr. Rao, the president of VCU, wrote, about 75% of the new students are from minority populations, making this the most diverse class in VCU's history. I'm very proud of this, but part of me wonders if Dr. Rao's statement reflects categories only. We don't yet know how VCU will be experienced by the new students this year. I'm going to stop now and let you think more deeply about what diversity means to you and how you see diversity working.